So we mentioned in the last movie that fossil fuels are a finite a resource and we will run it out of them at some point sooner or later so let's talk about some ways that um, we can generate energy in other methods that don't rely on fossil fuels or coal well fossil fuels including coal and um, talk about some ways to um, uh, think about how we use energy at the very end so here is our so here is the pie chart of all of the sources of ener source all of the resources that we use to generate energy uh, in gray are all the other methods that we discussed previously including fossil fuels and nuclear energy and then that green wedge is our uh, renewable resources so these are resources that um, we can either use indefinitely such as solar power or wind or uh, geothermal, or they are resources that, uh, such as biomass, that we can regenerate. So we can grow trees and burn them, and then we can grow more trees and continue that process. So let's look at some data about our use of renewable energy and the and how our use has changed over time. So this is a plot of renewable energy consumption since 1965. And you'll notice that by far the largest source of renewable energy is from biofuel. So this includes um, uh, trees, forests, anything um, organic that we can burn. So these are what we term biomass and biofuels. And you can see we've been using them for quite some time. In fact, in the very earlier graphs in the beginning of uh, the lecture, um, you can see that our use of biofuels has been consistent since about 1820. Okay, so what are some other changes that we can notice from this graph? Um, our use of hydropower is the second largest use of uh, renewable um, sources of energy, and that has been expanding over time. So hydropower is using the flow of water to generate electricity. However, uh, we can see solar in yellow is increasing over time and uh, other sources are as well. So we are optimistic that we can increase our dependence on renewable sources and decrease our dependence on non-renewable sources. So this is the same graph as the graph we saw in the previous slide, but they've removed biofuels from the uh, quantification. So if we remove in the previous slide that big blue bar that is um, representing biofuels, now we have the second largest source of, um, of renewable energy is hydropower. So now that kind of overtakes all of the data here. By the way, um, this is just an aside for you as someone who is interested in properly presenting data. It's really good to be consist consistent about colors um, between graphs. So all of these graphs are generated by the same website, and I would recommend personally that you are con you'd be consistent with the color legend that you use. So in this case, um, if blue was biofuels, you would keep blue for that resource and keep all the other resources the same color. But that is a complete aside. So now we see hydropower overtakes the uh, number uh, is the number two renewable resource, and we can see um, the other um, resources here. We can they're expanded a little bit, so um, we can look at the numbers that uh, we can see there a little bit more closely, and we see all of them are pretty much increasing in width. So that's a good sign that we're using uh, these renewable sources more and more, and we're developing the technology to be able to use them more and more. And here are a couple of representations of renewable energy versus uh, GDP. So the essentially the, um, the the amount of money per person that each country has. So it's the GDP would be a measure of the prosperity of a nation and how much money that country has. And um, they're plotting how much money there is per person versus how much how many what percent of the energy is from renewable sources in that country. And it's kind of an interesting correlation because you have this inverse correlation. So you have this L shape of the data. So you see um, this is the L shape 
so it's kind of inversely correlated. And what this means is, is that all of these countries over here um, have a very low GDP for their country per person. So there's not that much money per person relative to a richer country, such as the United States, which is pretty much uh, one of the top countries in terms of GF GDP on this graph. So these countries that have the low GDP, actually, we see that a large proportion of them rely pretty heavily on uh, renewable energy. So up to 80% in some of these cases, which is kind of an interesting statistic if you think about it. And that countries like the United States, which um, have a much higher GDP than these other countries represented here, actually rely on renewable energy much less. And that's probably a testament to how expensive oil is to purchase and um, you know the infrastructure for bringing these resources into the country whereas you know solar power is available um, pretty much anywhere there is sunlight. So I thought that was kind of an interesting statistic. In this case um, one other note is that they're showing the um, they're showing some other information with the size of these dots that they're showing each country and I believe that that represents just the number of people in that country. So they're choosing to show another piece of information on the graph with another, uh, with another cartoon. Let's look at some more data. So how much money are we investing in renewable energy? And let's break that up into different technologies. So let's look at solar, for example, in the yellow bars. Uh, we can see that we've been ramping up our investment in solar energy until about 2011, and at that point, uh, we've been consistently consistently investing about the same amount of money, perhaps increasing our investment in other types of renewable energy, such as wind to some extent. Uh, so that's promising. We're starting to put more money into it, and I think this investment is going to pay off. Now, I think a clever way of thinking about um, renewable resources and non-renewable resources as well is that they're all powered by the sun. So of course fossil fuels at some point were organic material that was living on the earth and plants and um, other living things were powered by the sun and then the sun uh, directly powers solar energy of course and the sunlight uh, causes differential heating of the atmosphere which leads to wind, etc, etc. So I think this is a, a cute little um, cartoon showing you that actually um, all energy pretty much depends on the sun. And if you think back to our, uh, our classes where we saw these um, energy pyramids, right? So we always saw the energy entering the ecosystem through sunlight, and that was hitting those primary producers, which were uh, contributing all of their material to the ecosystem. So this is just one more demonstration of the sun being the primary source of energy on Earth. Um, we are investing more in the t uh, these renewable energies and the technology that powers them. And uh, one benefit of that is that we can see that the prices of solar panels are, uh, or the price of solar technology, for example, is dropping uh, pretty rapidly over time. So we can see the cost of a module back 1976. Uh, the, the cost per uh, the capacity of the module is quite high and uh, nowadays the cost has dropped from uh, what looks to be about, it's difficult to tell what the y-axis is, I'm going to guess it's about 20 if that's a linear um, range, hopefully it's a linear range. So um, it goes from about 20 to a fraction of a dollar. So that's a pretty good drop in price. So these technologies are also becoming much more affordable. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about different technologies. So biomass is that that big um, that biggest resource that we see really overtakes the graph that we've been using um, since before electricity was available even, right? We've been burning wood to heat our homes since we had but since before we had light bulbs. So biomass has been a source of energy for a long time. Um, nowadays we're using different sources of biomass, so we are finding other ways to burn organic material, to 
convert it into energy, such as animal residue or even municipal waste or sewage. And um, this would be an exciting new, uh, exciting new view of our of the availability of biomass to generate energy. So these are all the uh, options that you might use for biomass. Of course, uh, we might think of new ones in the future. So um, agriculture and forests being kind of obvious ones that you think about when you think about what to burn for fuel and then some less obvious ones. So the contribution of uh, biomass energy potential, this is from one particular country, uh, Myanmar or Burma. Um, but this is the data that they have for their country, so I thought I would show it. So they're showing you the contribution of biomass energy potential, and they break it down um, into the forest, the forestal sector, which is 63%, then livestock and poultry, agriculture, etc. So those are um, the sources that they had in 2005. Ten years later, um, they started having... Uh, biomass resources from the municipal sector, for example, in that red sliver there. So we are changing the dynamics of where we get biomass from. And this is uh, an example of biomass, so charcoal, for example. Uh, people prefer to burn charcoal because it um, burns a little um, easier and I think it's a little bit easier to transport. So. Here is a very important question, and this is going to be critical for you to understand. So make sure that you are able to explain why is it better to burn wood that is modern than it is to burn fossil fuel such as coal. So if we think about it, coal at some point might have been a tree also that lived on Earth. And uh, however, it's about... Um, about 50 million years old. So why is it better to burn modern wood versus ancient wood that has been underground for a long time? So can you think about some options? Uh, can you think about that question and think about what you think the answer is? You can pause the video now and think about it. I think that would be a really good exercise for you to see how well you um, are incorporating the information that we're learning. So <clears throat> let's talk about the carbon cycle. We've addressed this in the previous module of nu nutrient cycling. So we know carbon is uh, present in basically all forms of life and also in um, these underground resources that where we get fossil fuels from because of these forms of life that died and went down there and decomposed into another form of carbon. So um, <clears throat> We have this carbon distribution in our on Earth, where a lot of it's down here under the ground in in these uh, <clears throat> in these underground sources, and then we have carbon in the living uh, creatures on Earth and trees and animals, and then we also have carbon in our atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So if we um, go down underground and we start harvesting the fossil fuels that are present underground, we're shifting the balance of carbon to be present more in our atmosphere than underneath the ground. Um, if we take fossil fuels from the ground, we're taking carbon from these underground sources and putting them into the atmosphere when we burn them. So we're moving all of that carbon from below ground to above ground. However, if you recall from uh, one of our previous lectures, plants take in sunlight and convert that carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere to plant matter, um, eventually to cellulose and things like that, um, initially to glucose, but that glucose contains all those carbon molecules that used to be in the carbon dioxide and then is later on transferred either into energy for the plant or into plant material. So if we harvest energy through biomass, we're um, using plants that are taking carbon out of the atmosphere. You know, these modern plants are doing that now in real time. And then we're harvesting them and burning them and uh, we're releasing that carbon. Um, however, we are kind of recycling all the carbon that's already um, present above ground. So we're not taking more carbon from underneath the ground and putting it into the atmosphere. We're just circulating the carbon that is already in our atmosphere, not contributing more to it. 
So that's a very important distinction to understand. Um, what are some other sources of renewable energy? We can use um, uh, water to power um, generators. So, in, so if you think about, um, you can put these kind of generators in rivers and the ocean. They usually do not generate that much electricity unless you build something pretty substantial like a dam that allows you to um, create a much bigger uh, flow of water, a much stronger flow of water that powers your your generators a lot more robustly. Now um, that's a that's a nice resource that we can use. Um, there's obviously aside from the building of the infrastructure, there's no contribution of carbon dioxide to the um, to the atmosphere. However, you know there's there's actually a free way of getting energy that. Uh, is available to you right now without having to do any work at all, and that's the sun. And this is showing you a distribution of, of uh, sun power in different parts of our country, the United States. And keep in mind that you don't need a photovoltaic cell to transform sunlight into energy. You could use sunlight in the form that it is right now. You can use sunlight to heat your house, and um, in this case, they um, uh, this culture is heating their water and their food using sunlight as well. So it looks like this region has a high density of sunlight, so that obviously makes it a little bit easier, but, you know, sometimes the most obvious forms of energy are not the ones that we think about first. Um, of course, we can use solar energy in the way that we're um, used to thinking about it, using photovoltaic uh, cells that convert the energy from the sunlight into electricity and um, as we discussed these are these technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper um, by the year so they are becoming more and more affordable so here's a picture of a California home with solar panels on it and maybe one day that it will be on every single house in California Another resource that's renewable is geothermal energy and this is using the um, heat that is present underground and um, either in this case it looks like they're just flowing hot water but sometimes you heat water um, from uh, these these sources of heat that are deep underground and you, you you can use it to either generate electricity like they're showing you in this cartoon here or you can use geothermal energy to heat your house um, or uh, something similar. So in Iceland, most of the houses are heated with geothermal energy. So that's a free, well, once you build the infrastructure, it's a free way to heat your home, which can be uh, really energy um, uh, costly, especially in a place that might be cold a lot of the year. Wind power. So that's another renewable technology that you have to build a lot of infrastructure for, but it's um, works on the same basis as all of the other technologies that we've discussed. So there's some movement of something that rotates something else and creates electricity. Uh, this is a picture from Nevada, so not too far away from us. Um, you do need to have some space where you can uh, put these up that um, usually people don't want to live around these because they consider them to be um, not visually appealing, but that's a matter of taste, in my opinion. So uh, this is just showing you the inside, how the, the spinning of the blades is transferring motion to something else, and then uh, that spinning actually um, converts energy using a small generator. Okay, so our point is fossil fuels are a finite resource. So do you remember how long uh, we can expect fossil fuels to last. That might be an important number for you to remember. Um, oil production is going to decline in the next few decades, and that's a fact. And um, hopefully this transition away from oil is going to have important environmental consequences. So let's keep some things in mind when we think about how we can change our energy consumption. So one fact that I hope you take away from all of the data we showed here is that 30% of energy 
in the United States is used on transportation. So, uh, and we know that the majority of that utilizes fossil fuels, um, uh, gasoline. So, thirty. Let's uh, just kind of generalize and say thirty percent of the energy that we use in America is used for um, gasoline. So, one thing that is kind of obvious is utilizing um, sources of transportation that use less gasoline. So that's kind of an obvious way to reduce our um, our consumption of fossil fuels. And um, getting, uh, buying vehicles eventually, not, not buying vehicles immediately right now, but when you do need a new car, you can think about using a car with increased fuel efficiency. So they're showing you how fuel efficiency has increased um, increased for a few years, but then kind of plateaued out. What else can we do? So um, I think the majority of the energy that we use as individuals is transportation and uh, electricity in your home. So heating your house is a pretty big source. Maybe not here in California because people don't tend to do that very much. Maybe um, using air conditioning. Um, so having a more uh, having better insulation of your house makes a big difference in conserving energy. Um, not turning your heat up as high or not turning your air conditioning um, up as high in the summer. Uh, reducing your use of hot water, so hot water, um, your hot water heater takes a lot of energy, so just using um, cold water in your laundry. Um, replacing your light bulbs, and you can look up how much energy that saves you, uh, and saving energy on transportation, so um, carpooling or uh, driving less, right? Just tell your boss that you need to work from home uh, once in a while. See how that goes. Um, and buying appliances that are more energy efficient is, of course, a good way to do it. Uh, one interesting thing about energy use is that when we learn about energy use and how these generators work, um, there are times of day where everybody pretty much uses um, electricity at the same time, and the power company has to build additional um, generators to supply the these peak times. So uh, um, SDG&E here in San Diego actually incentivizes people to use electricity more at off-peak times and um, this is actually a good way to be environmentally conscious as well because these additional generators um, usually first of all there's a lot of energy goes into building these additional generators but also um, they it becomes less and less energy efficient as you use all of these generators on on peak times so using electricity on off-peak times actually um, uh, utilizes less resources and saves you money. So these are things that you can talk about in your exercise this week. Um, you can use other passive mechanisms to save energy. So uh, using window shades to keep your house cooler in the summer. For example, here um, is a picture showing you a sustainably built house where um, they are blocking more of the sunlight in the summer and allowing more of the sunlight in in the winter to heat their home. So again, they're just using the passive nature of sun to uh, control the temperature of their house. And hopefully they have um, good insulation. So they're showing you the double paned window and a heat absorbing floor that allows the house to stay warm in the winter as well. So all of these features are very nice for um, saving energy on your heating and cooling of your house. Okay, thank you very much for listening.